So every week we go to the scriptures because it's there that we see the person and work of Jesus most clearly revealed. Our sermon this week, we're going to begin a new sermon series out of the book of Esther. And so we'll be covering Esther chapters 1 and 2 this week. You can find those on pages 483 to 485 of the Bible provided. Preaching this week will be Drew Knowles. Drew was a longtime pastor here at Sojourn Heights and is now the lead pastor of our most recent so Sojourn plant, that's Sojourn Oak Forest. So we're thankful to have Drew with us today. Please, before I read from the book of Esther, would you pray with me? Father, what a privilege it is that you have spoken to us through your holy scriptures. Encourage us where we need encouragement and challenge us where we need to be challenged. Open our ears to hear and soften our hearts to receive. And by your spirit, empower us to respond with joyful obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of the Lord from Esther. I'm going to read selected passage uh, from chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and 15 through 18 of chapter 2. So beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young woman to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Verse 15. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, peace be with you. My name is Drew. As Adam said, I used to be one of the pastors here at Sojourn Heights. Over the past year, my family has moved uh, northward to the north of here um, and alongside a, a truly wonderful team of people we have been planting Sojourn Oak Forest. Um, one of the things I, I love about Sojourn is that we have always been a church planting church. We've always had multiplication at the very heart of our vision and of our strategy. And on behalf of Sojourn Oak Forest, we are grateful to you for your generosity and for your faith in sending us. At the same time, multiplication is bittersweet. Saying goodbye to friends and family for the sake of the gospel is good and it is right, but it's, but it's also bittersweet. 
And I have known that bittersweetness over this past year. I have missed you. I have missed being with you. And I have I've hurt watching you hurt. I've been hurting with you. And so it is so good to be with you today. I'm, I'm grateful to the elders for inviting me back, especially on a day like this. As Adam mentioned, it is 11 years to the day since we launched this church. It's pretty incredible. We have seen beautiful days. We have seen difficult days. We have seen beautifully difficult days. And the Lord has been faithful in every one of them. Um, All right, so now it's my honor to kick off a seven-week sermon series through the truly fascinating book of Esther. In 597 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took the people of Israel into exile. But the Babylonians were then conquered by the Persians. And so the events of the book of Esther take place as the people of Israel are living under the Persian Empire. And it's important for us to know that the exile of God's people was more than just a punishment. The exile actually served a strategic purpose. Even under Babylonian and Persian rule, God was was advancing his purposes and making good on his promises. Specifically, he was preparing the world for the Messiah. You see, as a result of their exile, the Jews were no longer tied to the land of Israel. They were dispersed all throughout the empire. And so there were were synagogues all over the place. Despite being a minority culture, the people of God were planting churches, so to speak. God was using Israel's exile to prepare the world to receive the gospel. God was laying the groundwork for Jesus and his disciples who spent much of their time traveling around teaching in these very same synagogues. And so so in the midst of exile, Even in the midst of exile, God is at work. Even if he is nowhere to be found, like the book of Esther, even if he seems absent, he is at work. The kingdom of God was was never intended to be limited geographically to the land of Canaan or to the the nation of Israel. It It would begin there, but the biblical hope was always that the kingdom of God would be established globally. And that biblical hope was advancing during Israel's time in exile, whether they recognized it or not. Now, this also explains why, the why behind God's instructions to the people of Israel regarding how they ought to live and behave under exile. The prophet Jeremiah encouraged the people of Israel to accept their exile, not to resist it, and to trust God in the midst of it. In Jeremiah chapter 27, God makes it clear that he is permitting Babylon to establish the Babylonian empire. And he commands the people of Israel to submit to Babylon, to serve Babylon, to honor Babylon, to pray for Babylon, and to seek the welfare of Babylon. And this divine instruction is it's really looming in the background of the book of Esther, as well as Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah. Anyone familiar with the prophecy of Jeremiah should be asking, are the characters in the book of Esther living faithfully under exile? In the midst of their difficult circumstances, are they trusting in the sovereignty of God or are they failing to trust in the sovereignty of God? So with that said, we'll turn to the book of Esther. For the, for the sake of time, Adam just read uh, a portion of chapter two, but I'm gonna be giving an overview of the first two chapters as we go. As we will see, the book of Esther tells the origin story of a Jewish feast called Parham. 
And the story is itself full of feasts. The book opens with an extravagant feast. We're first introduced to King Ahasuerus, the Persian emperor. From now on, I will refer to him as the king because I do not want to keep saying Ahasuerus. Um, we're told that he reigned over an incredibly vast empire, but his throne was in the capital city of Susa. So chapter 1, verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. It goes on to describe the extravagance of the king's feast. There were tapestries, linens, marble pillars, mosaics, gold, silver, fine wine. There were probably military parades with thousands of soldiers marching behind decorated generals. And listen, I, I think we should be slow to say that the king was self-indulgent or reckless here. There was a, cl a clear political purpose behind all this feasting. The king was growing his popularity. The king was earning the favor and trust of his people. And the king was attempting to maintain order within a truly vast empire. He invites rulers from every province, and he's garnering their loyalty and submission through festivity, through the king's generosity toward them. But he's also welcoming commoners, both great and small, it says, to feast in his garden. So this feast was probably well-received by everyone. This king was not just an immature and self-indulgent drunkard. Arguably, he is taking care to maintain peace and unity throughout a vast empire. And this sets the stage for what happens next. On the seventh day of the feast, at the climax of all this festivity, the king requests the presence of his beautiful bride, Vashti. On the, on the seventh day of the feast. But she refuses to come. Now again, we, I, I think we should be slow to jump to conclusions here. If the whole point of this feast was to bind the empire together, I think it would make sense that the king would want all of the various provinces to witness the queen wearing her crown as the essence and embodiment of royal glory. She is the feminine embodiment of the empire. The king has himself demonstrated the wealth and power and generosity of the empire. And now he desires to demonstrate the beauty and glory and elegance of the empire in the person of his bride. So it, it may be fair to call this a form of objectification, but we shouldn't dismiss its political purpose. As we will see, there are, there are many things in the book of Esther that seem wrong to us, and indeed many of them are wrong. But this was a different culture and a different time, and these things would not have been so strange to them. Regardless, Vashti's refusal to appear before the king presented a political crisis. The feast had been going so well. The power and glory of the empire was on full display, and now the king's authority is publicly in question. Something had to be done. And so long story short, Vashti is sent away. A decree is written with hopes of saving face. It's a PR campaign. 
and the search begins for a new queen. Every province throughout the entire empire was called upon to gather together their beautiful young virgins and bring them to the king's palace. Each woman was to prepare herself for a night with the king. And then the king would choose from among them his new queen. Again, we are struck by the immorality of this, but it would not have been strange at the time. In fact, families living under Persian rule would have been volunteering their daughters for this. So, we are finally introduced to the main characters in this story, Mordecai and Esther. Let's talk about Mordecai. Throughout this story, we often see Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Now, this does not mean that Mordecai was loitering outside the palace walls. The king's gate was the supreme court of Persia. The gate of the city was where the elders of the city met to, to discuss official matters. Now, there are, there are two things to remember about Mordecai as we continue through our, our study of Esther. The first is that Mordecai was a Benjaminite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Audience participation, ready? And which other notable Jewish ruler was from the tribe of Benjamin? Oh, wow, that's quick. King Saul. Over the next few weeks, we will come to understand the significance of this. But for now, just remember, Mordecai was a Benjaminite. And he is a Jew in power. He, he may have been the Jewish representative on the king's supreme court. Now, the second thing to remember about Mordecai is actually recorded for us at the end of chapter 2. So I'm going to jump ahead briefly. Chapter 2, verse 21. As Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king, in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, Mordecai is not immediately rewarded for this act of loyalty to the king. But the turning point in this whole story, the, the turning point in the book of Esther, will hinge upon the king remembering this, the king remembering Mordecai's act of loyalty. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about Esther, chapter 2, verse 7. Mordecai was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace. So, Esther was Mordecai's first cousin, but apparently, Mordecai was old enough to be her father. And Esther is taken into the king's palace in order to win the king's favor. Now, the, the narrative seems to me to indicate that Mordecai and Esther were a bit compromised. It seems that they had largely assimilated into Persian culture. Remember, as, as we read, we're supposed to be asking ourselves, are the characters in this story living faithfully under exile? Are they trusting in the sovereignty of God? At the beginning of this story, it seems clear to me that the answer is no. They're not trusting the sovereignty of God. They are not living faithfully under exile. To begin, let's look at their names. Mordecai means Marduk is Lord. Marduk was a Babylonian god. Mordecai is likely named after a Babylonian god. 
As for Esther, her Jewish name is Hadassah, but she doesn't go by her Jewish name. The name Esther may have been derived from the name Ishtar, which was the Babylonian goddess of love. And Mordecai actually commands Esther to hide her Jewish identity. That's not good. In verse 9, we see that she is not even bothering to eat kosher. She's eating and drinking whatever the palace provides her. This is in contrast to Daniel, if you read that. And she enters into a contest to win the favor of a Gentile king. She is actively trying to intermarry with Gentiles. In addition, as we will see, Mordecai is a Daniel figure, and Daniel was himself a Joseph figure. Both Joseph and Daniel were eventually elevated to the king's right hand. Both Joseph and Daniel were second in rank to the king. And as this story progresses, the same will be true of Mordecai. However, Joseph and Daniel did not scheme and maneuver for power in the kingdom. They were simply obedient. They were simply faithful. And they trusted God to elevate them at the proper time if he saw fit. But Mordecai is a schemer. Again, he commands Esther to hide her Jewish identity. He offers her up as a candidate to marry a Gentile king. And as we will see next week, he refuses to show honor to a duly appointed government official. Think back to the prophet Jeremiah. Pray for Babylon. Honor Babylon. Seek the welfare of Babylon. This is not how the Jews were expected to live in exile. But despite all these things, God is determined to use Esther and Mordecai for his purposes. Esther wins the favor of everyone, including the king, and she is chosen to replace Vashti as queen. Now, there's a theme emerging that I want us to see. The events of Esther, chapters 1 and 2, evoke patterns and images that call to mind Genesis chapters 1 and 2. It seems as though the imagery is intended to welcome a comparison with Adam and Eve. The king of all the known world is feasting in a garden. On the seventh day of the feast, his, his heart is merry and at rest. And like the animals in Genesis chapter 2, all the king's subjects have paraded before him. But more than anything, he's looking for his bride, his queen. But unlike Eve, Vashti is nowhere to be found. So once again, the king's subjects are paraded before him, this time young, beautiful virgins. But only Esther truly completes him. Only Esther is bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. In short, Esther is a new Eve. As it stands, everything seems to be going well. But again, as we will see next week, a serpent has slithered its way into the garden. And Esther, like so many great women of the Bible before her, Esther will be called upon to outwit the serpent, to beat the crafty serpent at his own game and thereby preserve the people and the promises of God. Of course, we as Christians are subject to an even greater and more glorious emperor than King Ahasuerus. We worship and follow the emperor of emperors, and his empire is even more vast than the Persian Empire. His kingdom is expanding and will continue to expand until the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. And who? Who has our emperor chosen to be the feminine embodiment of his empire? 
Who has Jesus chosen to be his bride and queen? The church. We are the new Eve. We are the new Esther. Our job is to serve the kingdom, to bring honor to the king, and to beautify ourselves before the nations. And how does the church beautify itself for the nations? Through holy living. By living distinctly in the midst of exile. By maintaining a quiet dignity in the midst of a hostile culture. And as Esther will demonstrate in the coming weeks, we must be willing to bear witness even unto death, even if it means death. Concealing and, and suppressing our Christianity is not the way to live within a culture that opposes us. We want to maintain our distinctiveness. How do we do that? Well, that's largely what we'll be talking about over the next six weeks. For today, I want to share two things we definitely should not do. Number one, we should not give in to despair. It's tempting to look at all the darkness and depravity and truly foolishness around us and, and to think, there is no hope. What kind of world are we handing over to our children and grandchildren? There is no hope. I've thought those thoughts. But despair and cynicism never get us anywhere. In fact, despair and cynicism, I, I think, are unbecoming of Christians. It, it's, a, it's a faithless posture. It's an unbelieving posture. We're effectively saying God has lost control. The fact that I feel out of control means that God is out of control. It's a faithless posture. And so we must persist in hope. Number two, we should not assimilate into our culture. Just as it's tempting to despair, it's also tempting to take the easy way out. Stop swimming upstream. If you can't beat them, join them. Life would be so much easier if we would just fall in line and become more and more like the world around us. But in doing that, in doing that, we're not only forfeiting the promises of God for us and for our children, we are choosing not to love our neighbor. Think about that. When a society is misguided, confused, and decadent, and depraved, that society does not need the church to approve of the decadence and depravity. That society needs the church to be the beautified bride of Christ and nothing less than that. To assimilate is to adulterate. And when the church commits adultery against the emperor of emperors, the entire world suffers. Our world is changing rapidly, and, and the church has forfeited a lot of its social capital. But thankfully, we as 21st century Christians are not blazing a new trail. There are old trails for us to learn, and the book of Esther is going to help us learn them. We're going to be asking ourselves the same question we asked of Mordecai and Esther. Are we living faithfully under exile? Are we trusting in the sovereignty of God? And I pray that uh, we may come to answer that in the affirmative. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in, in a dark 
and confused world, you are to us light and truth. You are to the world light and truth. Teach us to trust in your sovereignty as your people have been doing for millennia. Jesus, you are the emperor of emperors. You are a good, loving, generous, self-sacrificial king, and we are overjoyed to have been chosen as your bride and queen. Holy Spirit, beautify us. Inspire us with confidence to engage the darkness and confusion around us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.